myself the grandmother of race relations until very recently. And I decided I'd become the great grandmother of race relations <laughs> because some of the young people that I have trained have now become mothers and they were my granddaughters. So now I'm the great grandmother. I came to this country in 1959 as a postgraduate student at the Institute of Education. And what I found was the appalling state of Caribbean, African, and Asian people in this country. And part of my research was to look at how children were getting on in schools. <coughs> and uh, I found that teachers did not know how to deal with children from ethnic minorities. They would say, they didn't know how to speak to them, they didn't know the difference in the language in the Caribbean, you tell a child if you wanted to do something, please finish this. A teacher would say in this country, would you like to finish this? And of course I wouldn't like to, so I didn't. Okay, that's a simple matter. And parents didn't understand their role in education either. So what I'm going to try and do today is to give you as brief as possible as possible in the half hour that I have, an historical background of the Race Relations Act, the way in which things have changed, and the things that are still to be done. Now, in the colonial period, that is before 1960, there were only two Commonwealth countries that had independence, India and Pakistan. And they had got that in 1948. But when I got to this country, the other Commonwealth immigrants who had come here, first of all, as to take part in the Second World War, Caribbean people, African people, Asian people from India, before it was divided into Pakistan and India, were recruited to serve in the British Army. Most of those people returned to their country. In the case of lots of Caribbean people, when they returned to the Caribbean, there weren't any jobs for them, and they were recruited back to this country to work in factories. There's an amusing incident of an advertisement that was shown in the Caribbean, which said, come to sunny Birmingham. <laughs> it was done by BOAC who needed workers and in the BOAC as it was then is BA today, British Airways. And they wanted people to come and work in their factories and to be mechanics, etc. And the other one was that in spite of the fact that there was so much racial tension, Enoch Powell, recruited nurses and people to work in the health service from the Commonwealth. And he was the same person who later on, having come to work here, referred to them as rivers of blood. So I want to put you into the perspective of the state of mind of the ordinary British citizen. Now, a large number of Jamaicans returned here on the Empire Windrush. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Good. And the Empire Windrush in 1948. They worked in factories and in hospitals and on transport. And they were the people who had been asked to return to fulfill those jobs. And I always say, that if all the Commonwealth immigrants in this country stayed home for one morning, didn't leave their house, and stayed home for one morning, this country would come to a standstill. The NHS, transport, factories, just as a start, wouldn't be able to function without the input that is given by Commonwealth citizens. Now, there was a great deal, as I said, of unrest and a tremendous amount of <clears throat> uh, 
racial discrimination and really bad attitudes to Caribbean and African and Asian people. And it got so bad that in 1961 and 62, there was an Anti-Commonwealth Immigration Act passed both in 61 and 62. A large number of us were concerned, I was concerned about education, but a large number of other people were concerned about what was happening across the board in factories, um, in hospitals, in, in transport. And so we decided that we would have to do something. So we were having a series of meetings to think of exactly what we should do. And in 1964, Martin Luther King passed through this country on his way to get the Nobel Peace Prize. And we met with him, a large number of us, including Dr. David Pitt, who then became Lord Pitt. And we asked him what we should do. Now, the situation between blacks in this country and blacks in the United States of America were very, were very different, and still are very different. And whereas when I came here as a Commonwealth citizen, I could vote in the same year that I arrived, Americans born in America still had problems about exercising their right to vote. So what he suggested to us was we do some sort of civil rights movement. But we think that it was important for us to make sure that what we did suited the United Kingdom. And I well remember the words he used to us. He said that anybody with a social conscience and a desire to improve society had to, be sta had to stand up and be counted. And we felt that that was important. So we formed the Campaign Against Racial Discrimination. And that was not the only body that was fighting for legislation because without legislation, any pious comments or suggestions or promises that people made were just promises. They weren't going to be carried through. And in 1965, there was an organization set up chaired by the then Archbishop of, Can of Canterbury called the National Committee for Commonwealth Immigrants. And they, alongside CARD, helped to get the legislation in 1965. Now that act was a token act. It did not provide us with the real areas of concern. It was an act of conciliation. It didn't have, it was a toothless that bit of legislation. So what we had to do was to continue to fight. Now I don't know how many of you looked at the news recently this week and saw that Houston Station put up a plaque to a man called Xavier who had been refused promotion. He was a black Jamaican. And it is because of the research that we were doing and the campaign that we were carrying out that they had to promote him. And more recently, because other people are now saying, but there is no recognition of the people who pioneered these areas of work. So they put up a plaque. So if you go to Houston Station now, you will see a plaque to Xavier, commending him for all the good things that he has done. But at the time of the 65 Act, which, as I say, was one of negotiation and reconciliation, and if you're out of a job, your children aren't doing well at school, you put in part three housing by the local authority, which was the worst housing available, reconciliation and conciliation would not improve your situation. So we needed an act that gave the legislation meaningful consequences. And so in 1968, we got that act. And uh, that was what we had been aiming for. But to be able to get that act, we had to do a large number of bits of research. We had to mobilize national support. We had to raise the level of national consciousness. That is to get the 
politicians to be committed to it and to talk about the inhumanity of racial injustice. And we also had, as an organization, to assist black Commonwealth immigrants who were affected by the discrimination to find ways to cope with it. Lots of families were very disturbed and distraught by the amount of discrimination they suffered. So CARD's activities and other bodies came together to form a national campaign and that provided us with the 1968 Act. As a result of the 1968 Act, we had two bodies set up. One called the Community Relations Council, which had a large number of individual smaller groups across the country. And the other um, one was the Race Relations Board. Now the race, the Community Relations Commission was to help to get people to understand what they were doing and in each local authority area to have the, a, commun a local community relations council set up so that we could improve education, housing, transport. But the Race Relations Board was supposed to take up the cases of discrimination and fight those cases of discrimination. So the two things were working at the same time. I was appointed a member of the Community Relations Commission and spent a great deal of time going up and down the country, in addition to my teaching job, trying to get local authorities to begin to not put people in Part 3 housing. We've done away with Part 3 housing now. But in those days, Part 3 housing was really disgraceful. And that is where they put all the English and white families that had social problems and all the black families. Now, if you put those two groups together, what are you going to get? You're going to get a whole series of additional problems apart from the racial discrimination because you have people in great need, people in need of social welfare help, people in need of mental health, people in need of not suffering from the problems of racial discrimination. So we got rid of part three housing because of the work of the Community Relations Commission. And then a large number of cases were taken by the Race Relations Board to, through the courts. And because this is a largely law, 